Father, we want to thank and praise you for this time together that we have with you. Lord, we, just, we know that you're here with us because you promised that where two or more are gathered together in your name, you're here amongst us. So, Lord, we just ask this. It'll be a very enjoyable time, a very uh, informative, and also something that we can take from this to be able to live in our everyday life that will bring honor and glory to your name and bring others to know who you really are. We ask, Lord, that you'll help us to understand everything that is being taught, anything that is, uh, any questions that we may have, Father, that we'll be able to understand and get the answers that we need, that your name will be glorified through it all. Well, Lord, come and breathe on your word tonight. Make it alive to us. Most of all, may Christ in us come alive even as we read the words that our heart already knows. We bless you and thank you for seeing fit to put in writing your heart. And I pray that tonight we'd really grab hold of your heart and just learn things that amaze us and cause us to glorify you all the more. Bless you, Lord. and Come be with us now and make your word real to us. Amen. 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 All right, first, before we, uh, before we get into what you read for tonight, do you have any lingering questions from last week? Anything we didn't get to, anything you thought of after we left that you want us to cover before we go in? It might already be in what we're going to discuss tonight, but what are uh, some questions you have? Yeah, hello. Did Paul have a rabbi he was studying under? Yeah. Yeah, Paul was learning from Gamaliel, was the rabbi's name, and he was one of the best rabbis of all time. <clears throat> He's named in the New Testament, too, in a couple of places. Um, he was the one that spoke up when the, uh, the council was going to put to death all the apostles. He spoke up and said, that's not a good idea. So uh, he was a good man, a good teacher. Um, yeah, Paul says that he was a student of Gamaliel. Uh, it's in Galatians, actually. You'll see it in the reading for next week. You'll see um, he's named. And a lot of that, too, is the point of this, with, with a lot of historical con context, to uh, are there original like, writings that you showed us last week, the biblical writings, um, and stories and other things like that that do support things that have been like, that were found along the way too, or these like, you know, like, you know, like there's so many supporting things to all these characters, specifically Paul and Tom and him, but like, uh -huh. yeah, is there a lot of those types of um, You mean, like are the apostles and others named in literature outside of the Bible? Right, where they bring their day? characters in and talk about them that were like, you know, how they know, I, I've always kind of been curious to that as you, you know, talk about yeah. studying the word, where you find things that are um, also that you believe to be good sources. Yeah, outside of the Bible, not really. Um, there, there's a historian named Josephus who mentions Jesus. He's pretty reliable. Um, but uh, no, the apostles were not named outside of the scriptures. They weren't really famous in their day. Like if you read Roman historians, they know Jesus. But, and uh, Peter is named outside of that. As the Roman Catholic Church was starting to develop, they named Peter in Rome. And some things outside the Bible, and he became well known, but um, not really. Uh, they they were a, a little sect in the first generation of Christ. They were, uh, as we'll probably get into with the Galatians, they weren't really well known yet. They certainly weren't the powerful influence that we are today. And that they were a tiny band of faithful followers willing to sell it all and risk everything as it go around. So they didn't make the history books other than when Christians started writing the history books. But yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, it's not so much a question as just an, kind of like an observation. You talked about the population of slaves being so yeah. great in the, all of the cities in, in the Galatian area. And I thought how that spirit of oppression must have just been obliterated <coughs> and what that did to the slave owners because I'm sure many of them as can't imagine they're a whole lot different than what we 
than we, we have in our mind and that you know power trippy um, oh, yeah. you know power hungry mentality and that, and that spirit of oppression and how all of a sudden you have a massive amount of the population saying I don't need to fear you yeah you know you, you don't have that power over me anymore yeah well you, you can know, see them to be like your slave but continue you yeah. know, continue in slavery and it, Paul says later somewhere if you can get out get out but if you know you, you <coughs> if know, not use if it if not use that yeah yeah so. Yeah, that's what all of what Paul said to slaves, like in Ephesians, Colossians, everything that he said to slaves was to admonish them that, look, use your position now to glorify God. You're not their slave. Everything you do for your slave master, consider it working for the Lord, and you'll be paid in due time, even though you won't make any money now. Such a massive change and, uh, yeah. in the dynamic of the social order. Yeah, I'd love to, I don't know of any, but I'd love to read testimonies of what happened to slave masters when their slaves got saved. And what a testimony it was. We know that happened in America, in American slaves. There were many testimonies of slave masters that came to Christ hearing the gospel songs that they were singing and they were convicted about the way they were treating them. So that, that did happen several times in American history. And the Roman slave owners would have made American slave owners look like this was Club Med compared to the way they treated them in that day. Um, not that there's no excuse for what happened here, but. It was amazing how awful slaves were treated. That's a great point. All right, so how many of you had a chance to read through the letter without the numbers and, or without the punctuation and stuff in it? How many of you had a chance to do that? Most of it. Most, most of it. All right, tell me, so what, and even if you didn't, if you've read the letter before, let's talk about these things. Big picture, the whole thing. Um, as, and if you've read other letters in the New Testament, what did this book feel like compared to the rest of the New Testament? Like what's your, if you were in the Galatian church and they read this aloud on a Sunday morning, how would you have felt? How would you have felt if you were one of the elders in one of the churches in that region when they got the letter? <laughs> it felt very personal. Very personal. Yeah. Yeah, you definitely knew them and loved them. It, it was, yeah, it was with that. I'm talking right to you. Yeah, that's good. I was going to say, I probably would have felt like concerned, like, you know what I mean, like that conviction right away. Like, if you're reading this, I'd be like, well, what are we doing? Like, yeah. You know, like, I'd want to know what I was doing wrong, like, if, you know, the way he's speaking, because all the other books in the New Testament, even like the other letters that Paul wrote, like, it's, and I mean, he starts them all out the same, like, grace and peace to you, you know. Yeah. The other ones seem to start out like with a much more uh, comforting approach, I guess. And then this one, he's like, you know, you know, why yeah. are you guys doing this like yeah. right off the jump? Yeah. yeah, what's wrong with you people? Yeah, right out of the gate. Grace and peace to you. But what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, one thing if you read through the New Testament, especially if you read the letters in the order they were written, I don't know if I pointed this out to you, but does anybody know why? Paul's letters are in the order that they're in. I'll give you a hint. They're not in the order in which he wrote them. But like Romans is the first of Paul's letters. And then we get down to Titus at the end, or 2 Timothy rather, at the end. Anybody know why they're in that order? The people that put the New Testament together did it in the order based on the length of the letter. So Romans is the longest. They kept First and Second Corinthians together. And then it goes in by how long it is. So they're not, when you read the New Testament, that's not the order that those books were revealed from heaven. Hmm. So Romans is actually one of Paul's last letters. Um, so it follows after. So that's an interesting study. If you ever want to do it sometime, read the New Testament in the order those books were written. And if one of you reminds me, I'll show you, the, I'll give you a, a handout with the order on it. So okay. you can do that someday. Galatians, most likely, most everybody agrees, was his first letter. I guess because of all the everybody going back to legalism yeah it's yeah yeah it's quite an alarm that he that he had to that wait you really you guys going to try to do that hmm. what else for a general feel for the letter or what did you think about man if i was in galatia well i could just about imagine because of where i came from with religion yeah and to, it would be so easy 
not knowing anything else at that time, to fall back into mm -hmm. uh, trying to do things on your own, yeah. rather than you know, yeah. having the, uh, the grace and the, mm -hmm. the freedom that he provides. Yeah. Because of what did you know other than Judaism? You know, what yeah. did you know? Yeah, it's a whole new world. I yeah. mean, th you don't even have a grid for what Paul just came and preached to you. Then somebody came. I mean, the Galatians, though, you realize that the Galatians, as I shared last week, they weren't raised in Judaism for the most part. They were raised pagans. So these were pig-eating, fornicating, uh, as an act of worship kind of people. So they weren't raised in some strict religious thing like the Jews were. Mm -hmm. So for them, they'd been brought to Christ in this innocent, pure, I'm free. And all I know is God loves me. And all I know is I'm forgiven. And I have a brand new life in front of me right now. And somebody got in there and said, oh, but there's this. And then all of a sudden they're under that religious spirit, which they'd never encountered before. So you can imagine their innocence. You know, they, whoever came and preached it, they're like, this sounds okay. Yeah. To go along with what Warren said, when, when, when that legalism is ingrained in you for 40 or more years and you learn what salvation is, you think, what? Yeah. You no, know, wait a minute. This can't be right. I mean, all these years I've been wrong. Yeah. And that's what goes, it takes a while to really accept it. You, yeah. you don't accept it just like that. Yeah. Oh, that's huge. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, th yeah. I'm ready to let go of everything I've ever been taught. Right. And start like a newborn babe. And I'm 60 years old right now. Hmm. That's, that takes humility. Mm-hmm. And you'll see, I mean, like I think we opened up with last week, that was the struggle for the entire first generation of the church. They've been raised under the law of Moses. And now you're telling me all that's out the window? That sounds too good to be true. And, and that's what they felt. Surely there's got to be a price that we can pay for what we've done wrong. Did I see a hand waving over there? Hello? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I saw it prophetically. <laughs> one thing that, that just stands out to me is, not something maybe they recognize, but just uh, the need for fathers, like the need mm -hmm. for leadership, and for those that think they can just go and do church or whatever by themselves and they'll be all right. Mm -hmm. Do you need somebody who's gone before you to yeah. kind of keep you from hearing that kind of stuff? Yeah. I felt like at first it was scolding in the school, you know, I don't know, every time of. Well, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, it was like. Uh, I forgot how he was like, kind of like, sort of just like, you know, ripping in and giving the like, history, you know, like, like, like the art school. But then, mm -hmm. then you get all these great truths, and, you know, whatever. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was, that's a great view of it. And it's in the beginning of it, it's probably putting all of those who were deeply embedded in teaching that religion on notice that I'm about to school you. That's a great way of saying it. And by the end of it, reminding all of those, the slaves, the outcasts, the Gentiles who were viewed as less than compared to the Hebrews, you know, who knew God already. And he's going to put them back in their proper position in Christ. Somebody put you down and made you feel like you're a second class citizen of heaven. And I'm about to put you back where you belong, that you belong around the table with all of those who have known God for 16 centuries like that. And yeah, that's a huge message. I mean, these are slaves who'd been set free and are about to be put back in bondage. And Paul's like, no, nah, not on my watch. Um, so, yeah, it's passionate. I love this letter more and more now. I've read it through a couple of times, you know, as we're getting ready to do it. And I, I just really love his heart. So today we're going to look at the backstory because um, there's a lot that happened. We actually know more about the backstory to the letter to the Galatians than just about any other book we have in the New Testament because it's included in the book of Acts, all of what was going down, the things that Paul talks about in the first two chapters that are history is mentioned in Acts chapter 15. So we had this battle with dead religion like we've been talking about, trying to get resurrected. Jesus crucified the law of Moses on the cross. He crucified the handwriting of ordinances that were against us, Colossians 2 says. The law was dead, and there was an effort to resurrect the law along with Jesus. 
And that's why the struggle was on, like you said so well. It's just hard to let go of those things. And the Pharisees in particular, all the people who benefit from the old system are the ones who generally try to assault the new. They really come against it. And this is true, by the way, what we're reading and what we're looking at here has happened over and over again throughout church history. Every new outpouring of the Spirit, the group that resisted the hardest are the ones who had benefited from the prior move of the Spirit. That's why we have so many denominations. Most of the major denominations are the result of somebody holding on, a group of people holding on to what God did in their generation and preventing the new revelation and the new outpouring that God was doing because that's not how we experienced God before. And that's exactly what the Jews, the Judaizers were doing uh, in this time. Yeah? Why do they, why, why does this happen so much like throughout history? Like why, do, why is there always somebody trying to hold on to their religion when it like seems so much harder? Like, than just like living in the grace and freedom that Christ offers. Like, why does this continuously, like, be a problem that's a, it seems harder that way it's that's like a that, great that question. comfort zone i keep thinking of the the israelites <laughs> moses that, that moses led out of well god led out of egypt via moses yeah. right and, and how they just constantly <laughs> wanted to turn back they want to go back to that it's familiar yeah 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 and to answer his question sometimes it's peer pressure yeah you know from yeah. family members and mm-hmm. friends you grew up with Sometimes, sometimes it's that. 100%. Yeah, you're going to see in the reading for next week, even Peter got caught and even Barnabas got caught in this trap. And Barney knew Paul's message and preached it with him. Peter knew what God was up to with grace. And they still were getting sucked back in because of peer pressure. 100%. A lot of it, too, could be fear of the unknown. That's yeah. That next step of faith. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Staying in humility, being teachable. Absolutely. I have a question. Yeah. Ladies first. (laughs) (laughs) So when the, um, after Jesus was crucified and arose, and the disciples after they received the Holy Spirit, did they then start no longer keeping all the laws? Or? Well, that's, that's the problem. (laughs) They, uh, they were trying to figure out what do we do with the law? They didn't have a revelation yet because they heard Jesus teach in the Sermon on the Mount. What did Jesus say about the law in the Sermon on the Mount? He came to fulfill the law. That he yep. came, that he came not to it. abolish it, but to fulfill it. Yeah. But he also said whoever teaches someone not to obey these commandments, right? He, he said that's uh, not so much as a stroke of the pen of the law. So they're trying to balance that with this revelation that, wait, so the cross, perfect sacrifice, they're, they're just by the Spirit trying to get all of this. When you read the Gospels, there's not a lot of what Paul teaches in the New Testament in there. So Jesus left them with a Holy Spirit. He didn't leave them with the Bible. He left them with the Bible written here. Mm-hmm. And he said, now go and enjoy the freedom and you'll figure out answers to all these questions as you go. And so we're reading about a moment, like a pivotal moment in the revelation of the new covenant in Acts chapter 15, 20 years after the resurrection. And they're wrestling with the issues that you read about in that chapter. That's how intense it was and how confused they were about what to do. It probably didn't help that they were still in Jerusalem, surrounded by now Pharisees who had come to Christ, right? We see them cast the characters in this council. They're there teaching, well, you know, we're experts in the law and, you know, it, it's the law of the Lord is eternal. What about all of these things that God said about, you know, from generation to generation and so on? What do we do with all that? Which is why Paul really is unique among the apostles. And you'll see t- next week when you read his story and find out what he was doing between when God knocked him off his high horse on the road to Damascus and when he started preaching that we read about in the book of Acts, there was like a decade and a half long process that he went through. It's fascinating stuff. But it was really hard for them to understand. This is the Bible. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. Psalm 19 says, why would we get rid of all that? Why can't we just blend it together with Christ? And that's what Paul's entire ministry was all about. Let me explain to you why you can't have both. 
And that's what Galatians is all about. So excited to dive into that with you guys. Yeah. I was going to say, too, um, we're always questioning whether it's gotten really that good, especially when you're in a persecuted place. I mean, of course, we're going to wonder, are you really good at God? Yeah. 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 That's what the religious spirit always tears us away from God's goodness. It makes him out to be the... uh, the one we should be afraid of, especially when we do wrong. And it's just not like that. But when you've been raised in dead religion, it's hard to see God that way, right? Yep, absolutely. So um, so let's look. Here's the council. Oh, yeah, you were going to say something. The other thing that, as he was asking about why they would go back to it, is the fear of man. A lot of times you're afraid to go back. I mean, you're afraid to go forward in the freedom that you have because you're going to get persecuted by man. That's... Mm. You know, if you don't have the true freedom from Christ. Yeah. And just like whenever, uh, was it Barnabas and who was it that went back and wouldn't eat with the Jews when he saw Paul was caught? Yeah. Peter and Barney both. Yeah. Because they, they, some people came, some Pharisees from Jerusalem came. So they're like, uh, they said, hey, what are you doing eating be? with those unclean Gentiles yeah. over there? Oh, oh, my bad. Judgment. I forgot. We didn't wash our hands. It's a judgment. Five too. times before we <laughs> ate. Yeah. It's a lot. They yeah. definitely had a lot. So we could be gracious to that first generation. Mm-hmm. You could be a little frustrated with them too. Like, why are you so racist? Why do you keep away from Gentiles? But they were taught by the law of Moses to keep a distance from people that were doing these things. So it was a struggle. Um, so what happened in Acts chapter 15, you read that, right? All of you did your reading for today because we want participation. And you also had some notes, I hope, that you wrote down to answer some questions. So um, this was a council that... The, the reason why it's important to know for the backstory is because Paul was not one of Jesus' apostles. He wasn't a disciple at the time that Jesus walked the earth. So he was never numbered among the twelve. He's never named in any kind of a way. We're introduced to Saul before his name became Paul as the one who persecuted the church, as the one who would have sat in the council agreeing to crucify Jesus. And since he didn't get opportunity to do that, He's like, fine, I'll just wipe off his, his wipe his church off the map. And so how does Paul have the right to preach a gospel when he wasn't taught directly by Jesus? That's one of the big questions that the book of Galatians and Acts chapter 15 answers for us. Where did Paul get the authority? Can anybody just say, hey, I have a better gospel revelation than the ones who were taught by Jesus. I have a more complete understanding of the new covenant. How, how does, I mean, could anybody just do that? Yeah, because you have the Holy Spirit. Okay, and there are about 25 books that were rejected from the New Testament who all said, I have a revelation. I mean, the Mormon church exists because somebody had a revelation and added to the Bible and created a cult. Jehovah's Witnesses claim that they have a revelation that's not just the Bible, but some new information that you guys didn't know. And so there has to be some way that somebody can be affirmed as being called by God. Because Paul does say that. Jesus called me. He appeared to me on the road to Damascus. Okay. But you need the affirmation of those who already have authority in the church to move on from that. That's what Acts 15 is all about. Not just anybody can get up and say, they're all wrong, I'm right. Because that's how cults get started. So that's a really important issue. And it's still, is it still relevant today? I mean, you were part of a group, right, that claimed to do that. They had a better revelation than the whole rest of the church. So follow us, don't ask questions, which is how all cults operate. All right, so give me what you got from reading Acts chapter 15. Which, uh, no, we'll, we'll find out. So what was the question that they were trying to discern? This was a gathering of the church for the sake of discerning a really important question. The first, it could have been the first major church split if they didn't answer the question and agree on what the Lord was saying about it. So what was the question that they were trying to answer for the Gentile churches? Whether Gentiles had to be circumcised. All right. Yeah. So you lead somebody to Christ. They're ready to go get water baptized. Do you then circumcise all the men before or after they were water baptized? That's a big question. Anybody else glad the way they came down on that? Mm -hmm. I'm really glad (laughs) for that they came down. But yeah, that was the question. So 
What does it mean to be circumcised back in that day? If you're a Hebrew and you are circumcised on the eighth day, Jesus was circumcised, Paul was. All the good Jews were circumcised on the eighth day of their life. And they had converts that were called God-fearers. And if they were converted to Judaism, all the adult men who converted were circumcised. Is that in the law? Yep. That if you're a man, mm-hmm. that, that would still have to do that. Yeah, any man who wants to be a Jew, if they're not, whether they're native born or not, has to be circumcised in the law of Moses. That's why when Israel came across the Jordan River, all the boys born in the wilderness weren't circumcised. The parents hadn't done that. So at Gilgal, they stopped everything. And they said, we have to do this. We have to be right with God in covenant before we take the land that he's covenanted to give us. So glad they didn't get it. They, they would have had a few days where they would have been very vulnerable after that. So yeah, but what does circumcision mean? Cutting away the flesh. Yep. That's the spiritual symbolism of it and what happens. So it's the cutting away of the flesh. Is it cleansing of the heart? That's the hope. But the, Paul's whole point was you did that act in the natural, but it didn't actually do anything internally until you did it. That there has to be a circumcision of the heart, as Paul puts it in some of his letters. It was, it was your way of being in covenant. It was, a, it was a physical sign of I'm now in covenant with the Lord who made heaven and earth, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so the confusion that they all had was, all right, you're coming into covenant, right? So Jesus gave us water baptism, but this has always been the sign of covenant since the days of Abraham. We've done this. So of course, all the men who come to Christ, they have to be circumcised. And and Paul saw something different. Paul understood something different and single-handedly began to push back on that. Because up until that point, they were circumcising all the Jews who came to Christ. And they had some confusion what to do with the Gentiles. All right. So what were the the two sides of the issue then? To cut or not to cut? That's the question. (laughs) This is a very uncomfortable conversation. Try teaching kids about what David had to do to earn his wife from Saul. But that's uh, Saul the king, I mean. Yeah. You get to just make a promise. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, you know, it was just, you know, man being the head of the household and all of that. He was the one that physically had to do something. A wife was considered one flesh with him. So you were circumcised along with your husband, even though nothing physical. They didn't only like Islam and other religions circumcise women, which has no point at all except to remove. Well, anyway, that's a horrible demonic practice. Yeah. Well, she was uncovered. That's, yeah, that was why widows were cared for. You were pretty much married in your teenage years in that day if you were a Hebrew. And if you weren't or your husband died, then the community, there were laws about how you got to take care of the widows because they don't have a covering. So, I mean, that's how it was back then. Um, All right, so what was their answer in a nutshell? They heard it all. We're going to walk through the chapter real quick because there's some really important things to see about how, how should we decide things as a church? Mm-hmm. And maybe if we could do it the way they did it in the first uh, beginning of the church, maybe we wouldn't have tens of thousands of denominations today. So what was their answer? What were some of the things that they said in answer to the question? What's the big overall one? No. That's a great answer. <laughs> nope. That's a hard no. We're not going to circumcise them. because. And here's what Paul will bring out later in the letter. If you're circumcised, that means you're making covenant to come under the entire law of Moses. Mm-hmm. It's not just one act like how water baptism is for us. Circumcision meant from here on out, I am endeavoring to obey the law of Moses. All 618 of them. And let's start learning them now. Mm-hmm. Instead of just enjoying this awesome freedom in Christ yeah. and being forgiven and connecting with the God of heaven who has never wanted all of these hoops and right. barriers in between. The law of Moses came at the request of Israel, not because God said, here's what you got to do if you want to be tight with me. They asked for it. They asked, in effect, give us a fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Tell us what to do and what not to do. And that's how we'll relate with you. They, they did it all over again. Um, that's a side subject. So yeah, the answer was 
Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me some, what were your observations? Like, j could you picture yourself being in the room? What it was like? So we got, who are the people that are in the room? Name some of the people that were there for this discussion. Like, who all came out for it? You're allowed to, it, this is an open book question. Look at Acts <laughs> chapter 15, it's all right. I don't expect you to memorize the Bible. I want to bring out the life in it, because this is important. All right, Barney was there. Barney. <laughs> Barnabas, sorry, Barney. I mean, we don't ever call him by Barnabas. His name is Barney. Barney, who else? Peter. <laughs> Paul was there. Peter was there. Silas was an elder. Who's, who's that? Silas. Silas was there, yep. James was there. Which James? Jesus' brother. Jesus' brother. brother, right. The Apostle James had already been martyred by the time we get here, by Herod. So this was James, Jesus' brother, who, by the way, shows up for the first time in this. We think probably he was the one that wrote the book of James, but we're not 100% sure about that. We don't know which James it was. but So what's James' role in this gathering? He's the leader, really. Yeah. He's the one who decides. He speaks on behalf of the whole group, right? Here's the judgment that we've come to. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Who else was there? So the we Pharisees. got the uh, Phar Pharisees. All right, so Pharisees. Were they Pharisees from the temple who came out and were bothering everybody? What kind of Pharisees were these guys? I guess they're trying to be. They're trying to become a Christian, but have, still have the law. Yeah. Yeah, it says there were Pharisees who believed, right? Yeah. So these were people that came to Christ, like Paul, like probably, you know, um, Nicodemus, like Joseph of Arimathea. They were both Pharisees. They came to Christ. A lot of them came to Christ. Mm -hmm. So they came to Christ, but yeah, they had more baggage than anybody. I mean, the rest of the Jews were raised learning all of these things. These guys had their entire lives vested in the law of Moses, mm -hmm. teaching it, obeying it, and, and policing it. So they're in this meeting, and they're, they're strong. I mean, these guys spent their whole life in the... You did not want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Pharisee in a Bible contest. They'd be able to outquote you in Scripture, uh, outquote me, anybody alive, because that's all they did all day was study the Word and argue about what it meant. Reminds me of seminary a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we got all of these guys in the room. We have, uh, why did the council begin? What, what started all of this? Like, why did they even have this discussion? Some of the Pharisees rose up and they were like, oh, we got to keep the law of Moses, you know, they got to keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. And so yeah. they were like, you know, what do we do? Like, yep. So that's how the ruckus started when everybody gathered in Jerusalem. But why were Paul and Barney and who else came with them, by the way, who has a letter written to him by Paul later on? Uh, close, Titus. Oh. No, you had it right. You had a, a Timothy and Titus there. They were like, yeah, he had Timothy with him. So somehow Timothy, or Titus rather, Titus was from Antioch. <laughs> he got me going now. <laughs> Titus, Titus shows up with them, and this was bold. Titus was not circumcised. He was from Syria, so he's a Greek. So Paul... <laughs> I think Paul brought him on purpose just to be nudgy. Because <laughs> Paul's like that. He's like, you know what? I'm going to just give you an example of what I've been doing for all of these years. And you tell me if this man doesn't know Jesus better than any of you. Because he came in freedom without the baggage of the law. And go ahead and ask him anything about what the Lord Jesus is like. And he'll tell you, even though he never met him in person. So he brings him. He's uncircumcised. And he's like, there's a Greek... He's not circumcised, and all the Pharisees are, uh, 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 why is he in here? You brought an unclean Gentile into a gathering of Jews just to stir the pot. Well, why were they there in the first place? What, what had happened already? Beginning of Acts 15. It's like in the first three verses. Go ahead and look. <laughs> it's really important to understand the story. If you want to understand Paul's heart in the letter, and why he was so zealous and passionate about it. This is why. Because some men had come down from Judea and were teaching that you had to be circumcised. Yeah. To belong to 
Mm -hmm. Paul and Barnabas, they'd come back from that first missionary trip that we looked at last week. They were excited, sharing testimonies. The whole church in Antioch was erupting with praise because people from far away, already uh, Antioch in Syria was already like a Gentile church because this is not in anywhere in Judea or Samaria. These were Syrians. So it was, it was the first biggest Gentile expression of the gospel. Most of the people in that church were not Hebrews. So they're excited and hearing, wow, the whole Greek world is responding to Christ. This is amazing. And they're celebrating and they're having a good time, having bacon at their meals and pork chops and, and, and doing all this stuff. And they're really enjoying it. And then some people came down. When it says they came down from James, it just means Paul's holding James responsible for anybody who comes from Jerusalem claiming to represent that church. That's why it says some men came down from James, the way Paul describes it. So they came down and, yeah, they started going around and said, whoa, 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 what are you guys doing? The men, are you circumcised? Can you, you talk about being uncomfortable. <laughs> These rabbis and Pharisees are coming down and going, so did you get circumcised? <laughs> Drop your pants or raise your skirt or, you know, whatever. <laughs> Let me just check. And, and they literally would do that, by the way. That they wanted to affirm that you were, you couldn't just say it. Show us. Yeah. And they would do things like that. So can you imagine these guys come to this church and all of a sudden talk about a, a killjoy. Talk, you know, the, the every party has a pooper. That's why we invited you. And they come into this party. All of a sudden, there's, now there's a ruckus in Antioch. Whoa, 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 Paul. Do we really have to get circumcised now? Paul's like, no, don't you dare get circumcised. And so a big fight happened. And what was the Antioch church leadership's response to the conflict now that was going on. Is that when he said to send them back and find out from the uh, elders? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They said, all right, we're going to send a delegation. You guys say you're from Jerusalem. We are here because the Jerusalem church established us. So you go back up to the elders of Jerusalem and ask them to settle this question for us because well, why would that be so important? Why couldn't they just together gather the elders and discern? This is what we want to do about this question. Why was it so important to them to go back to Jerusalem? See, we live in a day where there's so many denominations. We've gotten so used to the idea of, well, you got that church over there and that group over there and that subdivision of the church over there. But in this day, it was unfathomable that they wouldn't be one church, capital C, all around the world. There was no such thing as anybody writing a letter to the First Baptist Church of Ephesus. That was so foreign in their thinking. So here's this church in Antioch, and they're saying, well, we don't want to be divided from the rest of the church. And that's the church that established us in Christ. That's the church Jesus established. The elders there, the apostles are there. We want to know from them what's the answer to this, because we don't have answers. We can't look to the scriptures, because all we have is the Old Covenant. So let's go to them. It was an honoring of the church that established them. I think that's a really important point when it comes to how churches ought to relate. We relate, you know, Hillside is a church plant of Christ Community Church. Pastor Dave Hess is our overseer from there. And so when we have issues here, we immediately go to them. They say, would you help us resolve this issue? I've only had to do it once in all of my years here, but that was our immediate we acknowledge that God used them to establish us in Christ. So we don't have a formal structure. There's nothing in our bylaws that says you must go to this church to do this. We, we just honor the fact that God used them in that way. And that's what the Antioch church was doing. They were honoring Jerusalem and honoring the fact that we're a tree that came from a seed that you planted. And so we're going back to the source. We want you guys input on this. We want to be one with the body of Christ. That's huge. Some of the problems we have, you know, our movement's called the Protestant movement. It wasn't the first major church split, but it was a big one. And we call ourselves Protestant. I don't like that in the label because I'm not protesting anything anymore. Martin Luther was. He was protesting the problems with the Roman Catholic Church. We're not protesting anything. We're just following Christ. And boy, the day when we finally just acknowledge once Christ is in the midst of his church, take down all the other names off the wall. Every other name is another name besides the name of Jesus. And that really is the only name we need. Amen. And that's what they, all, they instinctively knew. 
to, to do our own thing, if we end up doing something different than the Jerusalem church does on such an important subject, then we just made a division in the body of Christ. Even though we're 100 miles away, we don't want to do that. So it was huge and important. And if only we would have done it this way throughout history. Of course, the problem is <laughs> some of the powers that be wouldn't have had it that way. And that's a lot of why there is division. All right, so um, the whole thing comes around. We got testimonies from Peter. What was, why would Peter have something to say about what to do with Gentiles who come to Christ? What's Peter's experience with that? Anybody remember from reading the book of Acts? Was that the vision that gave him the with the animals? Yeah. Yeah, remember he's up on the rooftop in Joppa and he gets this really weird vision. Like, did I have too much pizza? <laughs> or was there bad fish I ate last night? But, it, you know, it was a sheet had opened up, all these unclean birds come out. Arise, Peter, kill and eat. He's like, I don't eat that. I'm a good Jewish boy. I only eat kosher. And so God said it again. He said the same vision to him again. And what, do you remember what God said to him then? If it's not, it's not unclean if it's from God. Yeah. If I say it's clean, Peter, it's clean. You've been taught this way all your life. I'm teaching you something new. This is the, the struggle, and some of you mentioned this, about getting out from under any kind of religious structure or traditions or ways that we've been taught is that God did say to do that. There was, under the law of Moses, you didn't eat those kind of birds. You, you didn't. But now God's doing a new thing. Can you let go of the old thing in order to embrace the new thing? So Peter had that encounter, right? Mm -hmm. Do you remember the name of the centurion's house that he went to? Cornelius, Cornelius right? He goes to Cornelius' house. He's a centurion, has a big household. He was a God-fearing man. Apparently he had a good reputation with the Jews. He was kind and generous and fair. And, uh, and so he goes and starts preaching. And what happened when he started preaching? Peter's preaching the gospel to them. They all got the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Did Peter have an altar call? No. Do you remember? <laughs> nope. It was like he was taking too long. God said, you go, you're taking too long, Peter. And whoosh, the Holy Spirit got poured out. Nobody laid hands on them. There were some from, it says, the circumcised, which means there were Jews with him, who I witnessed it. They saw that when Peter preached, the Holy Spirit said, I choose them. And they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, just like on the day of Pentecost. And so Peter's world is rocked. Peter now had an encounter with the revelation that the Gentiles are allowed in, and they don't have to jump through any hoops to have Christ in them. That was a powerful moment. So that was Peter's testimony. He came, you know, in the council, he said, look, you guys have heard the story already. I went to Cornelius' house. Spirit of God was poured out on them, the same as us, and they didn't have to do a dang. I didn't even get to baptize them in water. And they got baptized in the Spirit. God chose them without doing any of this stuff. Then it says that Paul and Barney started sharing stories from their trips and adventures together about how the Gentiles were receiving Christ. And then James spoke up. And this is really powerful. What's the, uh, the scripture that James read there? It's, uh, Acts, it's in verse 16. Does anybody know where that comes from? Yeah. Yeah, he recognized something. Now, James's role, he's probably the lead elder of the Jerusalem church. And so they trusted him to discern. This is, um, this is how our elders here meet, actually. When we discuss an issue, everybody has to share. And it, we do require one another to share. What do you hear the Lord saying? What, what's the Spirit of God saying? What do we see with our eyes? What are some testimony around that? And when we have to make a decision, we pull it all on the table before the Lord. And my role among the elders is to hear what everybody's saying and pull, help pull it all together and discern, this is what I hear the Lord saying right now. So it's not like James in this conversation just came and said, all right, I heard what all you said, but I think this. He's listening carefully to the testimonies and the scriptures that are going around. He's saying, I, I recognize now what the Lord's saying to us. And it was that we are living in the fulfillment of what the promised prophet Amos said. Just like Peter on the day of Pentecost. He saw what was going on. He said, hey, this is what the prophet Joel was talking about. And James discerned, this is what Amos was talking about. Now, they only go up to the first verse um, 
from Amos, it says, And that day I will raise up the fallen booth, the tabernacle of David, and wall up its breaches. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. Now that's where James stopped in his quote. But here's what Amos was talking about. And that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord. He said, this is the day that God has been looking forward to when David's tabernacle is going to be built so everybody can come and just freely worship. Who can tell me a little bit about David's tabernacle as opposed to Moses' tabernacle, which were both up at the same time while David was king? Tell me some of what, whatever you know about those two tabernacles. Both of them were the dwelling place of God. But what was the difference? And why was God... God never said, I'm going to rebuild the tabernacle of Moses. That's never once in any of the prophecies. It's always, well, in this case, the tabernacle of David. Yeah. <clears throat> Moses' tabernacle had the veil. You can go behind. Yep. Yep, Moses' tabernacle. Only the priest is allowed behind the veil once a year, or else you're going to die. Behind the veil was where the presence of God was. The ark of God belonged behind that veil where the mercy seat and the presence of God was. And nobody but the high priest was allowed in there. In fact, only the priests were allowed in the outer room from that. Normal people were not allowed within 50 feet of it. And even the priests weren't allowed in unless they made a sacrifice and washed their hands. Yeah, that became a tradition in case the high priest died when he went into the presence of the Lord because then you would die going to get his body, so they thought. Um, what about the tabernacle of David? Anybody remember that story? You can all go. Yeah. Yep. It was the day that David brought the ark in and he was dancing before the ark. And it says that David put the ark in a tent. He didn't put it in the tabernacle of Moses, which was up on a hill far away. He put it in a tent. And around that tent for David's entire reign, the priests worshiped night and day, freely around with the Ark of the Covenant in plain view. Nobody died during that. David danced, all the priests danced. Everybody was allowed close to the presence of God. And God said, that is what I want. You guys ask for all these hoops and religious rituals and this knowledge of good and evil stuff, but all I've ever wanted is to be with you. And thank God the apostles recognized this is what Jesus has been, God's been wanting this. So we're not going to make the Gentiles go through all the hoops of the tabernacle of Moses because this is the day that the tabernacle of David is up and then everybody can worship. Like Jesus said, you're not going to have to go to a place. It doesn't matter if you worship here or there for the hour is coming and now is that they that worship will worship in spirit and in truth. No more hoops. No more obstacles. You just come right to the presence of God. Thank God they came down on that side. Amen. Amen. All right. So anything else about that part of it? Let's get to what they determined. It says, um, let's go down to verse 19. It's my judgment that we don't trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles. No oops. But we are going to write a letter to them. And there are certain things that we're going to require of them. Why these four things? There are four things in the letter. Tell me what they are real quick. Four things they said. We still want you to do this out of the law of Moses. Stay away from, from things offered to idols. All right. Don't sexual eat things off to idols. Yep. No, Keep away from sexual immorality. Mm -hmm. What else? Blood yeah, don't eat anything mm -hmm. that has blood in it. Or anything that's strangled. Or anything that's been strangled. It's kind of weird. Mm -hmm. All the 618 laws of Moses, those are the four things. We just need you guys to honor these four things. Why is that? I mean, if you're going to hold on to something from the law of Moses, why would you pick that? Maybe pick one from the top ten, you know, or something like that. Make sure you honor your mother and father or something like that. But these four were in there. The answer is actually right in the passage, if you look. And I'll give you a hint. 
Wherever the gospel goes, you'll see this. If you read the book of Acts, you saw it in Paul's first trip. Where's the first place that Paul would always go to preach? In the synagogue. In the synagogue. He would first go to the Jews. And he even said in the book of Romans, the gospel is first to the Jew. Mm -hmm. Because they've been carrying this. They have the right to be first in. They, they have been God's people mm -hmm. for 16 centuries. And have been persecuted for carrying the presence of God all along. So they're going to hear it first. They'll understand it if they have eyes to see and ears to hear because they know the law. They know Christ in the law will be revealed. So they get it first. But then what? So what was their aunt? Why did they say, we got to keep these four things for you Jews or you Greeks rather who are now joining together with the believing Jews these four things? They said the Holy Spirit and us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the power of discernment within the church, right? That whatsoever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven, Jesus said about the church. Whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. So that's the authority of the church to decide things, that we, we, we're allowed, we're in fact called by God to do that, to do just what they did in this chapter. But interesting that they kept some rules. So why, why was it? And those four things come from you practice. 100%. I mean, they were the pig-eating Gentiles, they worshipped. Fornication was an act of worship for most of the Greek gods. Yeah. So that's there. It's not just that they had a sin issue. There was an act of worship. Like, they were passionate about it. Um, food sacrifice to idols. Paul spent some time on this. Mm -hmm. You've read 1 Corinthians and Romans. He definitely got into that with them about how to handle that issue. Um, what about uh, from things strangled? I've read that many times, but it always puzzled me. Like, yeah. what's wrong? What, what? How is that a sin? Yeah. I mean, the only th I mean, if you're asking why did God put that on the law of Moses, I have no idea. I don't know why certain things. I mean, that's one I haven't studied. Many of all of them have a reason for it. Um, most of it, like that one, is just conjecture. We don't really know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're probably biological and sanitary reasons for a lot of the law, like how to handle mildew and wash your hands before you eat, that kind of a thing. But there's a reason why these four for the Gentiles. You're going to take a shot at it? No, I had a, oh. I had a question because this really confused me, and I, couldn't, I, I spent some time praying about this and couldn't mm -hmm. figure out why these specific four things were listed. And, you know, I mean, obviously, like, I, I found out, I haven't read the law process too much, but I did see that it touched, like, on, like, not eating blood because you know a, a creature it said like a creature's life is in its blood or whatever like it, yeah it touching the wall and it on it. So I was wondering like about the food sacrifice to idols like obviously like you know like if it's related to idolatry or they're sacrificing it to their idols like I mean obviously like that, that's got to be wrong somehow but like yeah. that's what I was wondering myself is like why is that yeah that they're not allowed to take that in mm -hmm. yeah um, People that surrounded them that were Gentile, that weren't saved, to come to Christ, they had some pretty gruesome um, practices. Oh, yeah. And they were supposed to be, uh, to come apart and be separate. Right? Be yeah. separate from that devil who worship type thing. Yep. Where they separate for them, for sure. children that are, yeah. you know, all those kind of really barbaric things. So, yeah. Something to do with them, you know, being separate. We're following Christ now. Yeah. And not having anything to do with. Yeah. Christ. Yeah. I mean, if you want to dig in deeper on this issue, First uh, Corinthians eight, nine, and ten, Paul really digs in deep and expresses why, specifically, food sacrifice to idols. What's wrong or right about that? Why it's okay for some and not for others? So it says that. For, uh, verse 21, back in Acts 15. For Moses from ancient generations in every city, uh, those who preach him since he's read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Paul's basic message to the Gentiles and to the Jews was don't bring offense to anybody. Don't do something for your brother in Christ or your sister in Christ that's going to make them stumble. So those four things, for whatever reason, were particularly offensive to the Hebrews. And so he's saying to the Gentiles, look, 
the Jews are coming along with this whole get out from under dead religion, law Moses stuff. Here's where you need to meet them halfway. Don't be eating, don't be strangling your chicken that you're going to have for dinner that night because that will be offensive to them because they've been raised a certain way under the law of Moses. Don't offer meat that's been sacrificed to idols because it's unclean. And Paul will later say, by the way, for you Gentiles who came out, if you still have any spiritual attachment to that thing, it's not good for you either because that could suck you right back into the life you left. And so he has it both ways. But the issue always with Paul was honor the conscience of those around you. The strong should bear with the weaknesses of the weak. And that's always the rule of thumb. So, okay, Gentiles, you enjoy those kind of things, but you're going to offend your Jewish brothers in Christ, and it's not worth it. Now, you'll see by the time Paul gets finished with it and the Gentile churches, they're not worried about any of this stuff. It was kind of the first beginnings of, here's a brand new church, give the Jews some time to come out from under religion. Jews, you've got to give the Gentiles some grace to come out from what they used to do for worship, and we'll meet, and we'll just enjoy the Lord together. Yeah. I guess one example of that, like nowadays, I can talk about this so long as I don't remember which one, but like say, for one Christian, alcohol is a very big problem. I say everybody's an alcoholic, but mm-hmm. say, for you, you don't get drunk that easily. Yeah. Be fine. Don't think you like, you don't be bringing your wine or beer around yeah. to their place. That's no, that's like good. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, if you're around somebody who's still struggling to get free of alcoholism, um, it's really disrespectful and violating their conscience for you to drink in front of them. You may cause them to stumble. They may look at your freedom and say, oh, maybe I'm okay now in Christ. And you may have opened the door for them to backslide right back into the pit they came out of. So, yeah, that's hugely important. And that's, you know, a lot of what, again, Paul gets into in 1 Corinthians with that. So that's good. I mean, I just encourage you when you read the scriptures to ask those kind of questions. Part of why I bring that stuff up is to make you look deeper as you read and not just kind of read over something. Mm-hmm. But ask, oh, why the heck? Well, why that? Right? All right, so they write a letter. And now Paul's going to be able to carry this letter with him wherever he goes. And this letter affirms that the gospel that Paul's preaching, he's right. Listen to him. He's got a revelation. And um, what he's sharing, we endorse Paul's message. So now he's got something to bring with him as he travels around the world. It was kind of like, you know, today we have diplomas. You got your PhD in that subject, and that supposedly gives you some credibility. I think these days it, it's like my doctor used to say, BS stands for bull, you know what, and then <laughs> MS is more, you know what. PhD is piled higher and deeper, which a lot of degrees actually are like that. But it was basically, I studied and I've been approved by the ones who Jesus gave authority over the church. And they gave Paul their stamp of approval. And so he could take that with him because there are false apostles going out at the same time, including the ones who were stirring up trouble in Antioch and who'd be stirring up trouble and the reason for the letter to the Galatians. Um, Peter approved of Paul's gospel. They, you know, you'll see next week, they had a big clash. Talk about clash of the titans. Paul confronted Peter to his face right in front of everybody because of what Peter was doing, kind of waxing, uh, wavering a little bit on how he felt about the Gentiles. But Peter said in 2 Peter 3, you know, like, how do you know? Imagine this, you're, you're living in a day where there is no New Testament. The only thing you know about Jesus is from his sent ones, the apostles. So you have the ones that walk with Jesus. You have some disciples who heard what Jesus taught. And that's the only authority you have for the real Jesus. And already right out of the gate, if you study history at that time, there were so many false Christs and other messiahs still going around. How do you even know who has the authority to represent the real Jesus? Yeah, and you ask the question, like, am I part of a cult? <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent. And that, you know, they're like, this is a small group. They're saying wacky things. Then there's this Holy Spirit thing and people have fallen down to act drunk in the, at 9 a.m. And that's so weird. How do I know that this is the real Jesus? So that's a big active question. So you began with people that you knew you could trust. The 12, they were with Jesus. Jesus empowered them and gave them authority to lead the church to, to begin with. 
So their word was gospel, literally. Mm -hmm. So they could write the gospels, tell the stories, and they could say, yeah, what that person's preaching, what's happening over there, that's exact, that's Jesus. We recognize that as Jesus. Now that, that whole structure has to grow. You can't just go and ask these 12 people for the rest of all history, what's God, what's not. And so it was really important, if Paul's gonna be considered an apostle, that he has their stamp of approval, and they're writing the Bible. Whether they knew that they were writing the Bible or not, we do know. Second Peter, Peter starts talking about you know, some of the false apostles, and he said, regard the patience of the Lord of salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you. So whoever Peter was writing to, they also knew Paul as an apostle. They had letters from him. And he goes on, he says, and, and also, as also in all of his letters, speaking them of these things, some of which are hard to understand. <laughs> I love that line. Peter's like, I read Romans and I, man, I got questions. But <laughs> speaking of them, they're hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort as they do the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. So Peter said, Paul, he's writing the Bible. You can trust him. What he sends to you, it is as gospel true as anything you hear from us. That was a huge, really important endorsement. And you'll see what Paul says about that in chapter 2 of Galatians. Like, well, you'll see. I'll let you tell me what you think next week. So they, so they sent this letter. It goes out with Paul. Probably this is when Paul wrote to the Galatians, having heard that these same people that caused trouble in Antioch were causing trouble up in the churches he established up there, undermining the message that he'd preached about the simplicity of Christ. Just be born again, live the simple Holy Ghost life, and, uh, and, and it went out. So it says that there was agreement. It seemed good to the Spirit and to the whole church, except there was a group that didn't agree. So they passive-aggressive, probably sat there in the middle of this meeting, say, yeah, yeah, we agree. Send out some representatives, because this thing that Paul is sharing, these, things, these guys are missing it. And that is a dangerous thing. It's malinformation that they're sharing about the true gospel. So we're going to give the full gospel, which includes the law of Moses. That would be Paul's... Some people think this was what Paul meant by a thorn in the flesh. This group, the circumcision or the um, Judaizers, were going to follow Paul everywhere he preached the gospel. You'll see Paul address that issue in every single one of his letters. He'll go after that because he was that concerned. Somebody's going to come and they're going to rob you of the liberty you have in Christ by coming to you and telling you you've got to get under some religious spirit. Oh, if only we could have kept that for the 20 centuries of the church and never allowed ourselves to get back under a yoke of external laws and rules and relating with God by do's and don'ts, treating the Bible like it's just a law book instead of a book of freedom. And so that's why this is so important. So um, let's real quick, we have uh, just a few minutes. What can we learn about church government and discernment from how these guys handled this issue here in Jerusalem? Is it a good model for us to use today? How would it even be possible to happen today? What would get in the way of doing it the way that they did here in Acts 15? Tell me some of your thoughts on that. Freely. A lot of voices. voices. Yeah. Who's the James of today? Who can say, I've heard what everybody said, and here's what the Lord's saying in all of this? I mean, is it the Pope? I mean, the, the concept of Pope could be biblical. The way it's happened, demonic. I'll say it. There, I said it. The things that have come from that seat have been some of the most demonic acts in all of human history. Yeah. So clearly not sitting in the seat of Peter by any stretch. But the idea, there's a council, there's a group that the whole body of Christ trusts. You're going to discern what the Lord is saying. You have no political agenda. You have no dead religious spirit you're trying to impose on us you're not trying to micromanage our lives 
you're going to hear on behalf of God for the major issues of the day so that we could be in one accord about these things. Wouldn't that be awesome? Well, and my question is, how long did they fellowship to make these decisions? That's, yeah. That's, it's like, and then it pleased the apostles and the elders and the whole church to send chosen men of their own company hmm. to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Bar- Barsabas and Silas, leading men among the brethren. So how many... How many people were together and how long were they together? Yeah, that's to a make great these question. Decisions and then to have the Holy Spirit involved in that, yeah. how long were they in prayer? Yeah. So it, yeah. It's, it leaves you kind of open-ended on what was the fellowship like? Did we all just hang out at church and we all just brought our sleeping bags and pillows and we have camp out here and make food in the kitchen and then we're all going to discuss all of this and live together? I, it could be. I don't know. I would it, suggest absolutely 100%. Because that's what we see for the entirety of all the book of Acts up to that point. That's yeah. how they did church. Yeah. They met together house to house and at the, you know, at the temple. They heard the apostles teaching. They continued in the apostles doctrine and fellowship, breaking of bread and prayer. There's no reason to believe that they didn't engage in all of those yeah. regularly together. And out of that atmosphere, yeah, God yeah. spoke. Whoever. I was just thinking about the, the uh, founding fathers and what we know about when they got together to mm. form our constitution. It was like, this mm-hmm. is it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. They did. They got on their face and they cried out to God. Like there are stories about three hours in prayer before they began deliberations again. Yeah. yeah. After of all people, Benjamin Franklin rebuked them for trying to do it without God's help. Yeah. I was going to say is good to know about like, what has been the biggest sermon, especially nowadays. It's online. Everybody is. Oh, yeah. Now, like, a speaker on Christ. And whatnot. Yep. Everyone's a pastor on their computer. Yeah. Everybody's it, an it expert. It's hard to know, like, which ones are truly mm-hmm. following God and which ones are not. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, now everybody has a platform, right? So you can just go out. But so it was in the first century. There were plenty of people that went out, started preaching their own thing, and led people astray. I mean, uh, the further on you get in the New Testament, the more the apostles are really railing against that. John went off on uh, false teachers and false prophets. And, you know, Jude, man, you read that book. That's Jesus' other brother. Man, that's like reading hellfire brimstone on the false teachers. It was really, it was a major problem. So today, yeah, everybody's got a platform. The consistent message you'll see when you read the New Testament is they always went back to people they knew. I want to know your character. I want to know that you're following Christ. I want to see the fruit of your life, that there's something to follow me as I follow Christ. And always, Paul will always exhort. Peter will always exhort. They'll always say, you have elders, right? You have people that you've acknowledged God set in place to shepherd the flock of God and have oversight. Why are you looking to these teachers who came from nowhere? You don't even know where they're from or whether their message is endorsed by God or not. Why would you follow that instead of the ones that you know? Um, You know, God made communities of people and we're just too quick in our day and age. There's 10,000 instructors, but not many fathers. And that's always what the New Testament comes back to who is as a father to you, who is the one who's willing to lay down his or her life sacrificially to see to it, not that you believe everything that, they, that comes out of their mouth, but that you're thriving in Christ. And those are always the people that the apostles would point the church back to when they were struggling with issues. All right, we only have a few minutes, but we're just kind of looking at the introduction so there's, we could probably get through this here briefly but the beginning of it (laughs) you see this is a father who's speaking to his children as if they're playing next to a cobra's nest and he's passionate and urgent about hey you guys what i don't know what happened to you but we're going to get away from this thing right now so um he opens up the letter first uh he says paul an apostle let me get let me find galatians here Paul, an apostle 
and all the brethren who were with me. Did you guys catch that? He's saying, here's who's writing this letter. So this one we know for sure it was Paul. That's why Galatians was one of the first books accepted into the New Testament because we could affirm, yeah, Paul actually signed that letter. So his name's on it in the manuscript so we can trust it. Um, but he says, Paul, and then he says, and all the brethren who are with me. So who was he with at the time? After the Council of Jerusalem, where did he go? Did His he home go church. Back to Antioch? Did he go back to Antioch? Yeah, is that what you were going to say? Antioch, yeah. yeah. He went back to his sending church. And that's always, you see if you follow maps of Paul's mission trips, always comes back to Antioch, the church that sent him out in the first place. He honored them, and that was his home base until he moved to Ephesus later on. But that, that's later on in his ministry. So he was with the whole church. So it, it, you, I'm just picturing Paul hanging out with the elders, maybe, with some of the church members and saying, hey, I'm going to write a letter to Galatia. Because those, remember those guys that were here causing us trouble? I heard that they were up there doing the same shenanigans. So let's send them a letter. It's very possible that there were people with Paul that added some things into the letter and say, hey, you know, you should tell them about that, Paul. <laughs> You're looking at me like, I mean, but he said he acknowledged me and the brethren who are with me. I think that's a wonderful way for truth to be spoken. Because when there's a consensus of what the Spirit of God's saying, there's so much authority in that and so much light and truth in that. So it's not Paul all on his own, holy man up on the mountain. It's Paul with all the rest of the saints who have been growing and thriving in Christ. And we're going to send something to them that's going to help them get free of this religious thing that's come over them. So um, he goes on, he introduces himself, right? Through whom um, he gave grace um, to, uh, to the Gentiles, right? We receive grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all Gentiles for his name's sake. Now you were saying before that he's, he's now named himself as an apostle. Yeah. And it also says that not from men or by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Yeah. And all the brethren that are with, brethren that are with me. Yeah. So it made a big point there that he is now considered one of the apostles. Yeah. Yeah, in other words, and he's saying, I didn't call myself to this. And this is his first letter. Right? Yeah. So then he's right from the start before he wrote the letter. He's going to recognize himself as an apostle. Yeah, he wants them to know. I, you know, like there's a saying that some were sent and some just went mm -hmm. regarding people who go out into ministry. I'm very uncomfortable and will never have somebody here if I don't know where they came from. Like if they just showed up and they got a <coughs> gift, usually prophets are guilty of this one. They have a pro powerful prophetic gift, word of knowledge is flowing, whatever, but they have no church they're connected to. They have no ministry that they fellowship with. I'm very leery about that. And until I know where you're from, I'm not really gonna have you here in front of a church. You're out of order. <coughs> Everybody's connected to a fellowship. Everybody's part of a body. And some people just call themselves to ministry. And a call of God is always confirmed by the church, even apostles. The Paul and Barney went out on their first trip, as you read for last week, because the teachers and elders and prophets in Antioch were fasting and praying and ministering to the Lord. And the Lord spoke in the middle of that, set apart for me Paul and Barnabas for the work to which I've commissioned them. The church affirmed that apostolic call. Paul didn't just say, hey, I'm an apostle, I'm going. The Lord confirmed it. So yeah, but he knew this was God who called me into this. Yeah, 100%. He's starting it off pretty heavy. He ended with that introduction and tying it right into verse 10 where he's saying, I'm not doing this because of you or anybody else but yeah. God. And you shouldn't be doing anything else because of anybody else but God either. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, like uh, if, I, if I did, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be a slave to Christ. I'd be a slave to Satan. Yeah. yeah. And if you're doing anything, if you're doing anything for anyone else but Christ, then that's what you are. Yeah. It's interesting you brought up the fear of man there, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to talk to you about reasons for that, <clears throat> but we'll get there. But here's, so Paul's got a ministry to the Gentiles. Peter's got a ministry to the Jews. Anybody else find that funny? Peter is the foul-mouthed fisherman from Galilee. 
right? The off-scouring of Israel, throwing paper airplanes at the rabbis probably in Hebrew school. <laughs> Paul, Pharisee and student of one of the greatest teachers of all time, a member of the council itself, the Sanhedrin, and he's going to go minister to the pig-eating, fornicating Gentiles. <laughs> All I can say is that God has a sense of humor. He's hilarious. <laughs> he is absolutely hilarious. But there is something in that. I've observed it with people and where they're called to in ministry. I'm, I'm an embodiment of it myself. If you'd have told me that boy from Queens was going to grow up and pastor in a town that has fewer people than lived on the block he grew up on in New York City, I'd have laughed at you. But there's something about culture. Remember we talked about cultural bias when you read in the scriptures. When you're in a culture... It's a little bit like a fish in water. You don't know you're in water. It's just your natural environment. And there are, there are cultural things that you're not aware of. And you get so caught up in that, you don't even realize whether it's biblical or not. Mm -hmm. And so an outsider sometimes can see it and go, whoa, what's that all about? Not that the culture that I came from is perfect, right? I wasn't sent from heaven. Mm -hmm. New York City is not heaven, <laughs> I assure you. But because of what is a strength there and what are weaknesses there, some things become more aware. Just like if one of you went to New York City, there's some things that would stand out right away. Like, whoa, what's that all about if you went to the churches there? Like how they speak. I <laughs> once heard a pastor say, there was a guy who was making noise while he was preaching. He was, shut up in the name of Jesus. <laughs> what? what did you just say? That was a New Yorker. Very typical. Anyway, yeah, so he's going to the Gentiles. So now... He's going to do, throw this. Remember um, back in the Gulf War, that expression came out, shock and awe. Remember that? We're going to just blow him away with our initial attack. Here's Paul, shock and awe. Now that I've blessed you and grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus, I'm amazed. I can't believe that you're deserting him and you're you know, called by the grace of God. And now you've got a different gospel. I mean, he's right after it. That's the theme of the letter. What's wrong with you people? Like, no, he didn't mince words. He, honestly, I think Basically, Paul, Paul taught Trump. Donald Trump how to communicate is what I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Dude, like, soften it a little bit. Nope, I'm good. Right to the point. Well, I'm sorry, is somebody saying something over here? They basically called him idiots. Yeah, what's wrong with you people? <laughs> I'm amazed at you. I have doubts about you. Yeah, so I'm a, for a different gospel is the way he described it. So what was the different gospel that they'd received. Yeah, legalism, for sure. <laughs> a, a gospel yeah. of legalism. Here's good news for you. For free in Christ, but you're going to be slaves to the law of Moses. And you've got to cut off you know, some parts to, to get in this thing. <laughs> I like Sorry. What, I like what he said in the next, the next verse, then, which is not another. It's like, it's not. if it's not the gospel, if it's not the good news, then it's not a gospel at all. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I, like if, you know, there are no quotation marks, but I'd put air quotes around another gospel. Because mm -hmm. it's not another gospel at all. There's no good news in bondage to the law. Absolutely none at all. What are some different gospels that are making their rounds in our day? Legalism is still alive and well. We could say that for sure, but what else? Uh, I was going to say what you touched on earlier, like, you know, the Mormon and Jehovah's Witnesses, their, their beliefs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, some of the cults. Yeah, they mix just enough scripture to sound right, but then they put it, it's like a little bit of poison. How much poison? I used to do this thing with kids to show them how a little bit of things from darkness poisons the whole thing. And I'd, yeah, I'd have a five gallon tub of ice cream and I would take some cat poop, just a tiny little bit, put it on the edge of my spoon and said, this is just a tiny half teaspoon. Mix it in. Who wants a sundae? Yeah. <laughs> And that, yeah, that's what, what, those, what the cults often do. They take just enough Bible so it sounds good, but then comes this poison in it that's destructive. What else? Following the Mosaic Law, I assume that from today, keeping all 106 or 18 commandments. Yeah, it, that is still alive and well. The Judaizers are still around. I've, had, I've lost friends over what, I, what I've been sharing with you and what we've been discussing who insists no Christian should keep all the feasts. That's usually where it begins. You should keep all of the feasts according to the customs and traditions of the Jews. But that's not even in the Bible, that, that stuff. And I'm positive. Well, you'll see when we get to chapter 5, Paul directly addressed that one. 
Like you're back in bondage if you, if you feel like you have to do that. Is it good to learn icing on the cake? Yeah, maybe, I, I think there's some useful things. And celebrating the feasts of the Lord, but not the feasts of Israel, the feasts of the Lord. Uh, but they all point to Christ and we have the fulfillment. Why would we need the shadow when we have the fulfillment in us, right. in our everyday life? So yeah, that one, what other false gospels are out there today? Like the 10th verse is, now am I trying to win favor of people or of God? Yeah. Sometimes you're trying to win the favor of people. Well, that's okay. We can, we should do this. We have to do that. Mm -hmm. Adding, adding more. If it's a Jesus plus something. It's no good. Yeah. Amen. What else? What's another false gospel or two? Did you have one? Yeah. But that that mentality of God is love, and and somehow yeah. what they really mean is God loves my sin, so I don't need to turn. I don't need to repent. I don't mm. need to change. Good point. Yeah. Gospel with no repentance? Right. Yeah. Mm. That's not a gospel. <coughs> That's a placebo. Yeah. I was going to say basically the same thing. You are free outside of grace. Yeah. You don't need yeah. the Lord. You, everybody, the many ways to heaven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't have to repent. You don't have to change. Your life doesn't need to be any different. He died for everybody. The sins of the whole world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so. You have to look, look nice or basically clean the outside of the cup. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah. look good, do good things. Yep. Right. Whitewashed tombs, right? That's yeah. A, yeah, that's a religious spirit if you ever saw it. Mm -hmm. It's all about behavior, not about a change of the heart. Yeah. My appearance. I'm not sure if it's an alternative um, gospel, but like my truth, this whole my truth is, uh, yeah. you know, everywhere, everyone, you can't argue with it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, there have been all kinds of different offshoots of it. So what's the one sure way that we can know that we'll always be able to get back to the true gospel? That's the spirit of the word. Okay. There's a line up with the word. Yeah, there's a lot of people. Everybody claims that they're hearing the Holy Spirit. Every cult leader. Every, yeah, it could be the fruits of it. You could judge it by its fruits. But when you hear it, is there a way to test it? To know if it's actually the truth. And as Steve said it, you got it's in writing. They continue daily, it says in Acts 4 about the early church, in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. We have the apostles' doctrine in written form now. So if it doesn't line up with the word of God, Jesus didn't say it. Holy Spirit's not saying that. Anything that we hear, believe, or understand that contradicts something in the word, it's not God. That's another spirit. And it sounds so good. You know, just the gospel is just love. God, you know, he just wants to love you and you don't have to do anything, not even turn toward him, which is repent. It's also, yeah. what do they do with Jesus? <laughs> yeah. what, what, what is Jesus to you? People say that they're Christian, but are you a follower of Christ? Are you, yeah. it, that's the difference too. Yeah. Christian, but yet living in sin. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Yeah. Like we were just talking about everything mm -hmm. there. But yeah, I mean, where's one of Christ the, fit in the midst of that? Yeah. One of the big ones is that if you're a member of a church, you're saved. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of denominations that believe that. Mm -hmm. It's like if your names are on the rolls of membership, that's the Lamb's Book of Life. And you're in for good. Even if we never see you again after you become a member and you go off and live like you did before, your name's in our book. So you're saved. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this morning we just got to talk about this for a second because in verses 8 and 9, he says about these people that are preaching, if we or an angel from heaven preaches another gospel, he's to be accursed. And if you didn't get it the first time, as we've said before, I say it again now. <laughs> like You said that already in verse before. Mm -hmm. if, if anyone preaches a gospel contrary to what you received, he's accursed. This is the same guy who wrote the love chapter the most beautiful love poem ever written, 1 Corinthians 13. And he's saying, I curse you. You're accursed if you preach another gospel. And he thought, what that's all about? Why so harsh? First of all, he's not the one cursing them. They're cursing themselves by preaching another mm -hmm. gospel. Can anybody think of another creature that was cursed? For bringing in another way to become like God. Serpent. Yeah. 
is basically saying you're no different than the serpent in the garden. They now are reading from the tree of life and having face-to-face -face fellowship with God. You, like the serpent, are coming in and introducing the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, religious dead works. You, you're, the, you're partnering with the serpent in that. The word there, though, is uh, anathema. That's a fancy word. It simply means you are set apart for destruction. You are irredeemable. It's like the ones that Hebrews talks about where it says, in the case of those who have once been enlightened, tasted of the heavenly gift, if, and been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, if they, and tasted of the word of God, the powers of the age that to come, if they have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance. If you want to understand that more deeply, join the life group that Steve and Tina lead, and Bill Vanderbush will explain that to you when you get up to it. But the bottom line of it is what, what the whole book of Hebrews, it's another passionate, really, I mean, it's strong, really strong. And it's urging everybody, get out from dead religion. Don't go back and make sacrifices at the temple because even the temple of God now is now a, no different than a pagan temple. There is nothing for you there. If you continue to put your hope in a sacrifice of a lamb that you made on an altar there, you are not saved. You're, you're following another gospel. And once you believed and seen Jesus and turned back to that, he says, look, that's impossible because you believe another gospel now. Your hope is in the wrong thing. So um, that's why it's so strong. So, yeah, am I striving to please men, as you brought out? Uh, if I were trying to please men, I could not be a bondservant of Christ. So I'll leave you with this question. When you share the good news, there, we've identified all these religious spirits and things that false gospels and all of that. Uh, are, are there things that you're willing to say, that we're willing to say and do in our day that may cause us to lose friends that we're going to say, you know what, I, I can't not believe what I believe. I can't unbelieve this Jesus that I have. One of the biggest divisions in the body of Christ is between those who hold on to, um, as Jesus described it with the Pharisees, of you hold on to doctrine and make it, you hold on to, you make for doctrine the traditions of men. Mm -hmm. In other words, you got traditions and they're as important to you as scripture. Are we, you know, are we prepared to fall under the fear of man and say, well, we just got to get along? Or are we willing to speak up and say, look, that's wrong. Here's, here's the scriptures. This is what it says. I've done that with a bunch of pastors and I've lost some friends along the way with that. I still love them, um, but there's some that won't talk to me anymore because of some of these things and I, I believe that that's what Paul was getting at that I'm prepared all my Pharisee friends even the ones who know Jesus now they're gonna be really mad and wait till they read what I say about Jerusalem and the temple they're never going they're gonna want to tear me limb from limb which by the way they did <laughs> later on all right any last thoughts before we break for the night all right for next week then um, we're going to go all the way through chapter 2, so pick up where you left off, verse 11 of chapter 1, all the way through chapter 2. It's mainly a story. It's mostly Paul telling everybody what he was up to for all those years between the road to Damascus and when he showed up at Antioch. And um, I'd like you to put together a timeline. Do your best to try to make your own timeline of Paul's life. In your notes there, I gave you a couple of dates that will help you get started on it. We're going to go with 30 AD was the year Jesus was crucified rose from the dead and ascended. 33 into 34 AD is when Paul was doing his persecution of the church. So that's about when he had his road to Damascus experience. And then see if you could piece together. What was he up to all those years? Where was he? What was he doing in his own words, which is all in chapters 1 and 2? There's a little bit of a description of a conflict that he has with Peter in Antioch. That doesn't show up in the book of Acts, but Paul describes it. So I want your thoughts on what was going on there and and what you feel about how they resolve that issue, or if they resolve that issue. And then um, kind of go back over Acts 15. We kind of covered it tonight, but Paul describes Acts 15 in his own perspective in chapter 2 of Galatians. So I'm curious, you look at what, how Paul describes it compared to how Luke described it in Acts, and tell me what you notice about what Paul um, made his main point of telling that story. So that'll be interesting um, to go because there's a reason why, again, all the background and understanding it and really digging deep is to understand the next four chapters of the book. Because um, really, 
uh, I think I shared with you at the beginning that Galatians is like a boiled down version of Romans. In fact, in your outline, I gave you uh, there's some chapters in Romans. I think I put it in your reading if you want to do bonus reading. There's some chapters in Romans from three to chapter seven that are described just in a few verses in Galatians. And the whole book of Galatians is like a short version of Romans. So if you read Romans and you're like, let's make him a head spin, just go back to Galatians because it's all in there. So um, that'll be for next week. Use your study notes, come with questions, come with revelation. I'm eager to hear what the Lord shows you as you read through the book. So I'll keep doing this question answer style like we're doing tonight. It's better if you come ready for that. So, um, all right, I love you guys. Yeah. I do have a question. Yeah. In all of his writing of letters, did they overlap? So was he starting a letter to Galatians, then to Ephesians at the same time? Could they have been, or is it like wrote a letter, finished it? Okay, now I'm going to write to this church. Type well, thing. usually um, I'll give that. you, if one of you reminds me, I'll show you that outline of where Paul was when he wrote what letter. Because mm -hmm. most of them he says, this is where I am. Or you could read in the book of Acts where he was and when that happened. The only ones maybe that happened that way are the ones he wrote from prison in Rome. Mm -hmm. So Ephesians, uh, Philippians, Colossians, and um, Philemon. He wrote while he was in prison in Rome. So maybe he was working on them all at the same time. Just curious, because you're referencing going back and forth saying read Romans this and so that just kind of like, yeah. oh, I wonder if he did. I never thought about it. That. I always thought, yeah. okay, he wrote that letter, now he's going to write another letter, like yeah. we do. <laughs> well, the thing we can learn from Galatians is that everything that Paul writes to all the churches, he already had it in his heart at his first letter. Like the entire book of Romans he was carrying in here, yeah. and then he wrote them when it was time. All the revelation about you know salvation and grace and all of that he already had it so um yeah um that's a great question though i'll give you that if again remind me because i'll forget in about 30 seconds that i said i would do it okay. and i'll have that list of where paul was what year he wrote it you and you'll tonight see tonight or next i'll time? have a few next week, next week. Yeah.